אני שמח להזמין לבמה את קארין קלוסטרמן, שהיא עיתונאית והמייסדת של קנאטק ושל פלוקס, והיא תדבר איתכם קצת על מדיקל קנאביס. בבקשה, קארין. I spent a year on medical cannabis, not actually on it, but researching it. I've done some pretty crazy things over the last year. I've dressed up in a cannabis leaf costume and I've danced around a vapor lounge, not inhaling. I've chased, uh, well actually just followed um, Breaking Bad style um, medical cannabis growers in Canada to legal grow operations. I've actually cried over stories that I've heard about little children and people dying for using, for needing to use medicinal cannabis. And I found how that medicinal cannabis is enriching and accelerating the growth of food technologies around the world. Now, when I started out researching medicinal cannabis, I started with my, my local connections, Facebook, right? I put a, a query to my friends and I found out that my friends are growing it, my friends are using it, family members investing in it. It's something that medicinal can cannabis is touching the lives of people already all over the world. The first person I had a really in interesting contact with was an old friend from high school named Nick Depede. He told me a story about a little girl named Charlotte. This is Char Charlotte Fagy. I actually went on to know her physician, Dr. Shackelford. Charlotte was having 300 seizures a week. She was dying, okay? She, had a, uh, she has something called Dravet syndrome. She has 300 grand mal seizures a week. Her parents put a do not resuscitate message on her medical records. She was having heart attacks along with her seizures. They were at their wit's end. None of the medication was working for this little girl. This is the picture of her before the treatment, okay? They turned to a research paper by an Israeli, Professor Raphael Mishulam from Hebrew University. He was doing medicinal cannabis research already in the 60s. The Jerusalem police had given him a five pound bag of hashish and asked him if he could do something with it. He was a chemist, he could do a lot with it. He went on to isolate THC, which is the psychoactive component in, in cannabis, and then he went on to isolate CBD, which is a very important uh, therapeutic molecule in cannabis. Now, the Figgies, with their little girl Charlotte, took, this, took a paper by Raphael Meshulam 30 years ago about how cannabis can cure or at least alleviate the dangerous symptoms of seizures. They took this paper to Dr. Shackelford, who I said is now my, let's say, friend. Um, I organized a conference in Israel and he was our guest speaker. So they took, they took this paper to Dr. Shackelford, who had, who had a lot of experience in prescribing medicinal cannabis in Denver, Colorado. He was working with people, mainly elderly people, with chronic pain from work injuries. He thought it was insane that these people were asking him to give cannabis to their five-year-old child. But as an evidence-based clinician, he knew that if he didn't help this little girl, she might die. So he poured over the papers, in fact, looked at the work of Professor Mishulam and decided he would give it to Charlotte. But how do you give cannabis to a little girl? Do you roll a joint and ask her to smoke it? No, you can't do that. Can you, do you put a sheesh in a brownie and ask her to eat it? No, you can't do that. So he went uh, to a farm that he knew of in Denver and they had a kind of cannabis which was very expensive. It was low in THC, which is the, the part that makes you high, and high in CBD, and they uh, Charlotte's parents, her mother, helped uh, find a way to put it into an oil and they gave it to Charlotte. Charlotte went from having 300 seizures a week to zero. Okay, so, so it changed their lives. This girl now has a somewhat normal life. Um, so, so there was a good case for cannabis. And now in, the, in, in Colorado, for instance, there's something like 12,000 families waiting to get this Charlotte's Web oil to help their children. Um, it's pretty exciting for a lot of people who are following medicinal cannabis, especially for Israelis where we have actually a very strong pharmaceutical history with cannabis. 
Now, if we look at some statistics of legalization, in Colorado, actually, the entire state is fully legal, which means you can buy it recreationally and medicinally. The cannabis is the same material, but it's just how it's treated with taxes and how it's prescribed. Now, of course, you need to be 21 or over to use it, and unless, of course, you're a child and you have a special prescription. Now, we look over the last year and tax revenues with medicinal cannabis and recreational sales, and Colorado has brought in about $70 million um, in taxes. And what is that money being used for? It's being used for policing, for schools. Um, they're even talking about issuing a tax refund to citizens based on some legislation that they have in Colorado. And it's being used to treat people who are going to uh, drug therapy, which is a clear statement saying, the legislator, legislators are saying that cannabis is not a gateway drug. Okay, this is something else. Now, all this story with pharmaceuticals and cannabis, it's really not exactly my interest. I was more interested in this, how what cannabis growers are doing can feed the world. Because cannabis growers are mad scientists, okay? I don't know if any of you know of any in the room here, but they are really mad scientists. They are not people who've necessarily studied at places like the Volcani Institute, okay? Or Guelph University in Canada, or MIT or Stanford. There are people like me and you who for some reason love the plant. They may love it because it's done great th things for them recreationally, maybe they use it medicinally, um, maybe they just like to grow it, okay? There's a lot of reasons why people do it, but what we have here is a, is a group of people who are mad scientists using a technology called hydroponics, okay? All of the major grow-ops in Canada are growing their cannabis on water, okay? And about one-third of all uh, cannabis growers in the United States are doing it as well. And what this means is they're actually perfecting the recipe for growing food better for people in cities, okay? The Food and Agriculture Organization is screaming, they're urging people to change the way we are growing our food. Conventional agriculture, despite its gains, 1% here, 2% there, it's not feeding more people, okay? Even if we have a new advance in pesticides, not feeding more people. So I've actually turned to what's going on in cannabis. I couldn't help it, I just kept going there because my technology is using hydroponics to help people grow food together. And I was just really floored at how much enthusiasm and interest in sharing is happening in the medicinal cannabis community from, from how they're growing it, to replicating it, to hybridization. And I want to show you a short video of a mad scientist who's actually now on my advisory team. His name is Dan Grady. Now Dan, just one second. Dan is, n doesn't look like uh, Old McDonald. He doesn't look like Dod Moshe, okay? He looks a little different. He's an Army veteran. He was in Signals Intelligence in the, the U.S. Marines Corps. He uses cannabis daily for post-traumatic stress disorder. He actually has been growing cannabis for about 15 years. When he started, he was doing it illegally. But now he's doing it legally in Canada for Health Canada, okay? Think about it. It's, it's an insane situation. Because actually, the people who know how to grow cannabis are the ones that have been growing it for a long time. Um, if you can, can you roll the video, or should I press play over here? Do I just press play? Yeah. Sorry. So this is Dan Grady. He's going to tell us about some technology innovations that might be needed uh, for growing cannabis, which can actually lead to better food production. Hi, my name is Dan Grady. I'm a master grower of medical cannabis. I have experience at every level of cultivation, from home growing all the way through commercial scale. I'm also a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and I've been using cannabis medicinally for the last 15 years. I was recently asked by a good friend of mine to identify a few holes that exist in current cultivation technology. This industry needs monitoring equipment that doesn't require an engineer or an electrician to install. Something plug and play with a clean user interface that can be interpreted by novice growers where the terminology isn't so convoluted. Just one crop failure in any given calendar year can cost any scale grow from 10 to 30% of their yearly revenue. Proper monitoring and controlling equipment can mitigate those losses. Most novice growers lack the resources to purchase proper monitoring equipment when they're starting up a grow. And that results in a lot of guesswork on their part. It would be nice if we could get a cost-effective unit in their hands early in their career to put them on the right trajectory. 
And on top of those things, I can always dream. I feel like it would be the holy grail to have real-time nutrient ratio reads in my reservoir. Flux, can you help me out? Okay, he, he really hammed it up for the camera. Um, but um, this, this is what's happening in Canada. He is a legal grower. He's running a $10 million grow up in Creemore, Ontario. Okay, and this is what you see, and I've been to another grow, uh, grow operation in Markham in a secret location. Same story. Actually, an Israeli is, in, is, is running the, the Markham grow up at Medrelief. Okay, big star of David, you know, big hair. These are, these are the farmers, okay, of, of the med medicinal cannabis uh, operations. So what I've learned over the past year is that cannabis can save lives. It's got enormous potential for helping us understand and build new food systems. And that you, you'll meet some of the best people that you could ever want to meet. But there are some problems for any young innovators that might be interested in getting into the medicinal cannabis business. One is investment. Okay, one, one thing I've learned over, over the last year is that there is investors in the United States are worried about cannabis because there have been some pump and dump operations in the stock market. And now they're reticent about putting money into the field. <coughs> That's why a lot of people are actually, there's, after I put on the Canatech event, I had a lot of interest from people from the United States asking about Israeli innovation because they know there's something a little bit different happening over here in pharmaceuticals in agritech, okay? There are a lot of Israeli agritech solutions which are being starting to be adopted by medical cannabis companies in the United States because the companies there have the money to try new things. Whereas conventional agriculture, con conventional farmers are slower to adopt new techniques and policies. Medicinal cannabis growers have a lot of funding and they're able to try new things readily. Um, another thing I learned is that Asking for investment locally is a, little, is a little difficult if you're connected to medical cannabis. Like, can you imagine this scenario? I'm standing in Bank Kaupolim in front of, you know, the investment, the head of the investment bank. And Hello, my name is Karen Klusterman. I'm develop developing a startup to help feed the world and grow medicinal cannabis. They're like, eh. Um, interesting, but, you know, how can we take that to our investors that are representing schools and unions and labor funds? It's complicated, especially when can cannabis isn't fully legal in Israel. And that's okay, I'm not pushing for lobbying, I'm not a politician, and I'm saying that's okay. I'm just saying and stating the obvious that cannabis can help feed people of the future. Um, another problem locally is that a lot of the people that are in the business, and I'm not talking about the agritech companies, but more of the pharma companies and the people who are growing it, is that the people that are really enthusiastic now about cannabis often are often using it as well. Um, and that may influence some of their business decisions, but it also causes a problem in Israel, for instance, for growers when they want to grow cannabis, but they can't actually use it. So you've got a situation in Israel where a number of the, of the medicinal growers cannot actually go into their own grow-ops because they've tested positive through, through urine tests for cannabis. It's an odd situation. Um, now, what's, what's even more odd is, is when I start to feel like this, okay? You know, investors, I speak with pe different people, okay? Even VCs, I've, I've started to, to line up meetings and everyone's joking, like, can you bring me a sample? Um, people are sending me um, leads for investments from Snoop Doggy Dog because he set up a new investment fund. So I'm like, okay, I gotta learn to twerk, I, I think. You know, I, I'm, I'm just putting myself in all these new funny situations and I, in fact, I'm quite a nerd. Um, I'm not going to tell you if I smoke or not. I think you know, every, everyone's decision to do that is, is personal. But this is how I've, I've started to feel over the last year. Um, now, one, one, one interesting anecdote I think that I came across over the last year, which, which definitely pertains to Israel, is previously I, I, you know, I was working as a journalist. Many people are looking for that formula. What is, what is Israel's secret sauce? Right? What is it? I've had CEOs of multinational companies talk with me, ask me, investors from around the world, people from the United Nations, World Bank, ask me, what, what is it? What do you think it is? Because, you know, you ask journalists these things, they're in contact with a lot of people, and I say, I don't, I think, yeah, maybe it's the army, you know, it creates a big sense of brotherhood among people. Um, maybe it's, it's, I don't know, maybe it's the Jewish nation because they've been studying the Talmud for so many years and they're very good at learning and, and doing new things. And, um, it's, it's quite possibly uh, living in a conflict zone. I mean, it makes people, you know, creative. 
And, and then I started working in this startup over the last year, and I was in contact with some hackers and developers, people from even elite groups like Shmone Matime, 8200. And they say, secret sauce? <laughs> I will tell you what the secret sauce is. This. <laughs> That's the secret sauce. So, I mean, I just, I just wanted to end with a joke. Um, and again, I'm not saying, I want to say that all programmers are getting high, but I just, I think that it's important to know that this is a part of our world, it's a part of our reality, and there, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, when we think about medical cannabis, you know, the, the statistics are that it'll be a $40 billion business in the U.S. in the next, um, in the next five years. That's bigger than the sales of wine, and that's bigger than the NFL, okay? About 14 states are expected to go legal in the next 14, uh, 14 states in the next five years. Can Ca Canada is already legal for medicinal uh, purposes, like in Israel. And there's one country in the world that is fully legal. Does anyone know what the country is? Where? Netherlands? Prague? It's Uruguay. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>